Uh, why do we talk about China in the energy sector? Well, it is now the largest user of commercial energy in the world. It's the uh, second largest importer of oil. It is a growing importer of gas. It's the world's largest emitter of greenhouse gases from energy. It's a major player on the international coal markets. Its national oil companies are the biggest investors around the world from the developing and emerging nations. So if you are in the energy sector, you cannot avoid uh, the Chinese energy sector itself and the energy companies. And interestingly, as of last week, when the takeover of Sinuk of Nexen was approved, Chinese national offshore oil company will be the largest oil producer in the UK offshore. So they are arriving on your doorstep. They may not be here, but they're getting closer. So what I want to do today is briefly touch on their international oil and gas strategies, but I'm going to start on the inside, because if you want to understand what China is doing outside, then you have to go back inside and see what their principal driving forces are. So we look at, uh, have, uh, most of my slides are pictures, just to show uh, certain trends. Here we have energy consumption in blue, production in red, over the last 30 or so years. And you can see it was rising steadily since the 19, early 1980s, when the economy started to open up. And there's been a huge acceleration in the last 10 years. And this was driven by a, a massive sort of investment boom in heavy industry and infrastructure, steel, cement, plate glass, and chemicals. And you can also see that the gap between consumption and production is growing. However, despite that gap, which is obviously satisfied by imports, some 85% of China's energy use is still satisfied from its own resources. Now this table is, is I put a lot of detail on here, in order to show a general pattern. And the key thing is the first line, as it were, this line that despite struggling over 20 years or so, China is still highly dependent on coal, 70% dependent on coal for its primary energy uh, uh, supply. Oil has stayed roughly 17-18%. Um, what has grown and is growing is natural gas, now up to 4%. Hydroelectricity stays at around 6%, and that just depends on how much rain there is. At the bottom, just starting to appear as significant, are nuclear and renewables. And as I was explaining at lunch, you hear about the huge scale of China's wind farms or whatever, but everything that in China that looks big is actually small. <laughs> Only that's including the, uh, the, the nuclear there. So if we look at the oil, uh, here we have from 1980 to the 2011, total oil consumption in the top line, and in the, the lower line, the flatter line, domestic crude oil production. And these two lines crossed in 1993. So 1993 was the big year that everybody talks about when China became a net importer of oil. Before that, in the 80s and the 70s, China was one of the biggest exporters. And I have a book written in about 1980 where an American is frightened that China would join OPEC. Anyway, those days are past. Uh, China is now firmly with the European Union as one of the major importers of, of, of oil. And we see in, 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 the, in the, the red line, I'm colorblind, so if I get the colors wrong, just imagine what it really is, um, that most that they have huge refinery sectors. So essentially, they are importing crude oil and refining it. And that is part of industrial policy in, in order to build their own refining business and employ lots of their people. But this gap is large. Um, some 56, 57% of China's oil needs are now imported, and that is going to continue growing for the foreseeable future. If we look at natural gas, we've seen that really this is a natural gas production in China has only started to pick up really in the last 12 years. Back in the early days, there were a couple of parts of China that produced gas. And it, well, I used to work for BP in China in the 1990s, and there was no point in producing gas in China. You wouldn't get any money for it. Nobody was interested. They just wanted the gas to make fertilizer with. This then started to change in the late 90s. And as you could see, they've been exploring. They are, their production in the blue line is going up very rapidly. 
their consumption is going up more rapidly and they are importing increasing quantities of natural gas, and we'll come back to that. So what is the oil used for? This is a projection from the IEA, and, and really the big message here is, is the green, uh, which is transport. So it's, it's transport that is going to drive uh, the future oil demand in China, unless there are radical steps to, to move away from oil to electricity or, or to gas. In the gas sector, um, the picture is more confused. The priority in natural gas for China is not electricity, it is city gas. And we were talking at lunch about pollution, and one of the things they have done is to, to get rid of the, particularly in North China, the district heating systems that were fueled by coal and replace them by natural gas. And again, industries are more and more using gas. So city gas, uh, industry, and, and the power sector is starting to pick up. But the problem with China's natural gas is that it is all expensive. There is no cheap gas in China. And so if you come to the power sector, the fuel of choice is coal, because it's about a third or a quarter of the price as, as, as of gas. So we've looked back. China can see the challenges, more and more gas imports, more and more oil imports, um, more and more energy demand for all sorts. So here's a slide. And well, obviously, today we're focusing on the right-hand column, but we still need to start on the left-hand column to understand what is China's domestic energy strategy. And you know, rather like America, it is let's maximize production of domestic resources, whether that be oil or gas or coal or hydro or, or, or whatever, but particularly when it's oil and gas, it's oil and gas reserves. Maximize the refining capacity, as we've already seen. Build the pipelines to move oil and gas around the country have ports for importing, uh, build storage. A lot of uh, oil in, can be imported into China is going into emergency storage for the first time. Um, they've been working on coal to liquids because they've got all this coal. They've been working on biofuels. But both those programs have really sort of slowed down three or four years ago because the government realized the, there were many environmental concerns with coal to liquids and competition with food when it came to biofuels. They've been working on hard on fuel consumption uh, standards of vehicles and emission standards, uh, but these aren't always being followed. Um, there are growing numbers of gas and electric vehicles in, in the cities. And rather late in the day, some of the cities are working on urban mass transport systems. But at the same time, Anybody who's been, who's been to China here? Right, okay, you've all been to the big cities and sat in traffic jams, yeah. Everybody who's got the money buys a car, yeah. Uh, so, so this is a real problem, the promotion of the private car sector, the disappearance of the bicycles, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, air travel is also growing hugely in China. Uh, fuel pricing, now I've always had this, sorry, it's got buried over the line here. I've always had this here from probably 10 years ago on this slide. It does get updated, but, but it's now here for a different reason. Actually, the price of a litre of gasoline now in China is higher than that in the USA. So the government is starting to push up the, the oil price um, to, to make people pay for it and to make people think uh, before they use it. So that's the domestic policy. The overseas policy, we're going to go through a bit more slowly, and I've got slides to illustrate many of these, so I will just highlight and then we'll look at a bit more detail. Diversifying imports, and I'll have a graph that shows how China draws in its oil imports particularly and gas imports from all over the world. Coming as it does as an economy that was once planned, where the economy is driven by the government, um, China prepared prefers government-to-government -government deals, long-term contractual relationships rather than reliance on spot markets. Um, and overland import, it feels insecure, uh, depending as it does on oil coming through the South and the East China Seas, and so it likes overland imports, and I will show you a map of that in a minute. Then we move on to the overseas investment strategy, which again I shall come back with, by their national oil companies, and then something that we don't talk a lot about, oil field services and construction. 
Um, I had a number of students in the major oil company, PetroChina CMPC, and when it was commercialized and corporatized in 1998, they had one and a half million employees. Two or three years ago, I asked my ex-student, who's a senior manager, how many do you have now? He said 1.6 million. And I said, well, wasn't that rather against the aim of the commercialization? And he said, yes, but these oil field service and construction companies have been hugely successful. And so they are all over the world, even in countries where the Chinese oil companies are not. Then we've got attracting inward investment from foreign national oil companies. Uh, and we'll come back to how that works, uh, the, uh, other, particularly with companies from oil-rich countries. Loans for oil. You may have read over the last few years that with strategic partners such as Russia or Venezuela or Kazakhstan or Angola, um, the Chinese government, through usually through one of the state-owned banks, will lend billions of dollars to countries in return that is then paid back in oil. And the biggest of these have been in Russia, where they paid, lent 25 billion in one go. And the return was the construction of a pipeline, oil pipeline from Russia to China, with the oil that then goes through that pipeline. Debt relief to places like Iraq, uh, diplomacy aid, and a whole raft of other strategies that support, either deliberately or not through intent, this overseas oil policy. So I'm going to illustrate um, some of these points with pictures now. If we look at oil, the details of oil trade, we see the top line, the crude oil import, and oil product import a much flatter line here. And you see at the bottom, we, we do, they do have crude oil exports, but they suddenly stopped in the late 90s uh, when they had an export contract with Japan and when their imports were growing, they just cut that contract and said, right, that's finished. They export product. Why? For two reasons. One, their refineries make too much gasoline and not enough diesel, so they have to import and export to get the balance. And second, oil product prices are controlled in China. As I just said, the price is there, but it's set by government. And sometimes, if the oil price inside China doesn't keep up with the external price, if you're a refiner on the coast, what do you do? You want to sell the stuff in order to get a decent price. Now, if we look at the sources of China's crude oil imports over the last 16 years, there has been a dramatic change. Um, back in the 90s, essentially Asia-Pacific, that's Indonesia and uh, Malaysia, were the main sources together with the Middle East. And uh, Malaysia and Indonesia's export capacity has diminished. Indonesia is now an importer, a net importer of oil. And so China has had to move to other places. The Middle East stays at about 45-50%. Um, Africa is the one that has grown hugely, um, particularly West Africa and Sudan. Eurasia is Russia and Kazakhstan, two neighbors where the oil comes in through pipeline. And the Americas, mainly Venezuela and Colombia. So you know there are about 30 or 40 countries now that supply China with crude oil. If we look at the future oil demand or oil import requirement, what we see, these are the World Energy Outlook, and probably Ed Chow shared some of these with you last week. Um, we're at 2010 here. We've got sort of high demand or lower demand, depending on how green they're going to be. And here is production. Okay, so I don't know where production will be in 30 years' time, but uh, the geology is is not good, and most of their fields are depleting. So China's oil production is unlikely to go up. It's most likely to go down. And so this gap between production here and future demand is just going to get bigger, at least over the next 25 years or more, unless there is some radical um, measure to deal with transport policy. If we look at gas imports, essentially there was no import until 2006 when China opened its first liquefied natural gas plant in the southeast. And so they've been building more and more LNG plants and will continue to build. 
and the first pipeline is from Turkmenistan. And if you look at the geographical regions they get their gas from, obviously the CIS, uh, former Soviet Union, is the Turkmenistan pipeline. And then you've got Southeast Asia, Australia for natural gas, very important, and Indonesia. Some gas coming from Nigeria, gas from Gata in the Middle East, and a bit of gas from, from North America. So again, uh, with, with gas, they're importing from all over the world and will continue to do so, and, and with oil. Projecting future gas demand and future uh, gas imports is very difficult, and the I was going to show the IEA forecast, but it doesn't make sense, so I'm not showing it. Uh, the problem with gas is that the, the supply and the demand, because of the infrastructure needs, are much more closely related, and therefore highly dependent on policy actions by the Chinese government. Okay, so there's no point too much in, in trying to predict what it is. And here we have projections of future gas imports, LNG, pipeline imports. All you have to notice is that the numbers are big and there's a huge range of estimates. Okay, so basically we don't know. Underneath this is one big unknown that we were talking about at lunch, which is the shale gas. You will have heard of how in North America uh, there's been this shale gas revolution of through horizontal drilling and fracturing, you can bring gas from shales where you didn't, weren't able to before. And this has revolutionized not only the US gas market, but will change the global gas market. China has a favorable geology. Uh, I think the big question is, will the political economy of energy in China and will the regulations and administration allow that gas to be exploited quickly or not? To date, the signs are not too favorable, but they're not really unfavorable. I was in Indonesia last week looking at coal bed methane, and there it's really unfavorable. So I think probably in China we will have a slow pickup, but they will get there in the end. But you know, So we got huge uncertainties in China's call on international gas markets. The only thing we do know is that it will, like with the oil markets, it will become a major player in global gas markets and in regional gas markets. Here's a map to illustrate some of these factors. What do I press to get a light rather than the, the middle one? The middle one, right. I can't see it. It must be, I can't see it because, because okay, but if I can't, then I can't write in the right place. It's obviously an obscure color. Sorry, right, I'm gonna to have to move. It's, it's red. A disaster. I can't see that. <laughs> okay, so you've got China here. Um, I've done it schematically, but the, the first uh, major pipeline coming in was from Kazakhstan, from the Caspian Sea, bringing uh, oil into China. That's a long way. It's got to go even further to get over to central China. Some of the oil in this pipeline also sometimes comes from, from Russia. Um, then you had the Turkmenistan gas pipeline that comes from Turkmenistan across to Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, and then into China, and then goes all the way to eastern China through a series of pipelines, uh, west to east pipelines here. There is also now a, a, a Russian oil pipeline bringing oil actually from West Siberia into northeast China. This, later this year, two pipelines will open across Myanmar, Burma. One is bringing gas exploited in Myanmar, produced in Myanmar, into southwest China. The oil pipeline will essentially bring any oil from any ship um, that comes in here across and therefore avoiding the Malacca Straits. So China has, over the last six years, built up quite a substantial strategic network of pipelines that reduces its dependence on the dash lines, which are the sea lanes of communication, which brings oil from the Middle East or from West Africa, through the Malacca Straits, through the South China Sea, uh, even through the East China Sea, up to the major import terminals along the East Coast. The yellow dots are sort of symbolic indications of where the liquefied natural gas plants are, bringing in gas from, as you've seen, all over the world. What you don't have is a gas import pipeline from Russia. 
They've been talking about it for not 20 years. Yeah. Give them time. Give them time. The Russians are not easy to negotiate with, neither are the Chinese. And anybody who's still looking at the slides will be thinking, what are the black dots? What are the black dots? They are ports being built or built by the Chinese. Uh, these two are on Chinese territory, the rest are not. In Myanmar, in Bangladesh, in Sri Lanka, and in Pakistan, these are large ports that could, if necessary, be used by a future Chinese navy uh, to protect its sea lanes of communication. We now move to the overseas investments, because this is often what makes headlines. Um, they started in, in the early 90s as China was just becoming uh, a net importer of oil. Uh, these were small, uh, small projects of little significance, except it gave the companies a chance to try out their skills and learn about working overseas. In 1997, you then had uh, some big onshore projects, Sudan, which you will have heard about, uh, Kazakhstan, Iran, and Venezuela. Gradually, in the 2000s, they started to widen their scope uh, deep water, tar sands, LNG, and some active merger and acquisitions buying up smaller companies. 2008-9 marked, again, a few big investments. And it's interesting, the global recession meant something quite different from, for China's oil companies than it did for our oil companies. I met one of my, uh, say, uh, ex-students, senior manager in CPC, Christmas 2008, and he said, I said to him, what does the recession mean to you? He said, this is a great opportunity. And you can see this from 2009. Uh, China's been on a, on a shopping spree with you know, deals worth billions of dollars at a time, buying up major assets, mainly in the Americas for the first time, and uh, buying from Western companies who need, like BP, I used to work for, that needed to sell either because they'd had a ghastly accident in the Gulf of Mexico, or otherwise they needed some more cash flow. And so, you know, billion, 10, 20, I don't know, 30 or 30 billion or so has been spent in the last three or four years, mainly in the Americas, by the two or three top Chinese oil companies, including in Britain, PetroChina buying a, a refinery up in Gragemouth, and Sinuk buying Nexen, which makes it the largest oil producer in the UK North Sea. And Sinopec buying Canadian Talisman, that also makes it a significant player in the North Sea. Getting big in Australia as well. So they stopped investing new big projects in developing countries or in you know, countries uh, which are pariah states, if one wanted to use the word. They're now moving in, in big time. The quantity of oil they produce... 64 million tons, something over a million barrels a day they produce from these overseas fields, uh, which is, yeah, it's about 20% 20, 20 of their total domestic production. So it's significant. But what's important to know is that oil doesn't necessarily go back to China. Okay? Most of the time, the companies sell it where they can get the best value for money. Here is a summary, and, you know, just feel it. You know, need to read it. Uh, as to the number of countries that these co companies are invested in, in bold I've highlighted my judgment of uh, where, the, where, the, where the biggest uh, investments are. I, just, I was realising looking forward that I've got the United Kingdom other, under Uzbekistan. I'm not quite sure why that fits there. But I had CIS in Europe and there was almost nothing in Europe until the recent investment. Um, What's interesting about this, as I say, I've been building up this slide for about eight years, and I used to have percentages at the top um, to indicate rough percentage of the distribution of, of investment. And until four years ago, America's was 5% yeah, of total overseas investment. Now I've got it as, as number one. This is where the dollars are today, are in the Americas, from Chinese national oil companies. And I'm going to end or near end this by saying, well, why is this happening? Why are these companies going out all over the world, throwing these billions around? And I identify sort of four sets of players, each with different sets of objectives. 
the Chinese government, the Chinese national oil companies, the host governments, wherever they are, and the host national oil companies. The key, I think, is, is, is if we start with the national oil companies, it's very simple. Uh, until at least the shale gas revolution might start, the amount of oil and gas to be found in China remaining was very small. So if you're a big oil company, you have to get out. There was no future in China. So the national oil company's ambitions are very clear. Get out, build new business, get new reserves, new production, new profits. Yeah, otherwise they're going to disappear. Um, and, and so it was basically business. Uh, also avoiding tight governance and price controls. Yeah? You're sitting on the other side of the world, <laughs> governance may be a little looser, certainly in what country you're in, but certainly you're away from government price controls. You can send, sell stuff directly into the market. And I think what is interesting and is particularly in the case of the North Americas and South America is technology and skills. This isn't just catch up, it, it's now they're buying into the unconventional gas the deep water offshore Brazil, uh, the unconventional oil, they are going to be at the frontiers of oil and gas that they are then going to be able to take back to China to exploit their shale gas. For the government, it was a mix. There was this belief several years ago that still lingers on that if we have a Chinese company overseas that has an oil field, this somehow enhances our security of oil and gas supply. It doesn't. You know, oil field in Sudan and Angola, if the Malacca Straits are closed or there's a war in the South China Sea, does nothing for you. But they still believe it. More important is industrial policy. They chose a few sectors and say, we want these companies to be major international players. And that makes a lot of sense. Social policy, employment. As I say, CMPC still has one and a half million people. Financial policy, it brings in foreign exchange. The oil companies are the biggest taxpayers uh, in, in the Chinese economy. And it's an arm of foreign policy. It allows you to go into areas that you wouldn't otherwise do. And I think the fact that China has three major projects in Iraq is not just due to national oil company ambitions. And I'm sure it's due to China wanting to place itself in the Middle East. Host governments have a range of objectives. I'm not going to go through them all here, but different ones will have different objectives. We need the money. We need the skills. Uh, we want to annoy the Americans. Think Venezuela. Uh, we're a pariah state. No one else is going to come. Think Iran or Sudan. So there's a range of host government policies that says we want the Chinese. And again, the host national oil company may also have, you know, we don't have any money. We want to work with somebody who's got money and skills and uh, access to opportunities in China. Uh, we've got Saudi Aramco, and we've got the Kuwaitis now building refineries in China to sell their oil into China. And I think the interesting thing is for how long will these objectives converge in different countries, and we're already seeing Chinese oil companies starting to have problems in different countries around the world, not least Nigeria. So, a series of questions. You know, what does all this mean for global oil and gas supply? The Chinese are locking up all the oil and gas. Well, no, they're not. They're producing stuff, selling it on the market, or even if they send it home. If they are investing, that's good. There's more oil and gas. Unless you're green, then this, yeah, that's bad. But if you're looking at, <laughs> looking at oil and gas markets, it's good. They're producing stuff. They have lots of money. They're throwing it into new production. What does it mean for the large international oil companies? Well, BP and Shell are suddenly finding they're going to bed with new players. Uh, if you go to Iraq or Angola, then BP and Shell and, and uh, Total are partnering with the major Chinese oil companies. I think some of the smaller international oil companies or medium-sized ones and some of the NOCs from other oil importing countries, India, Japan, um, Malaysia, and Korea, they are finding it's very tough competing against the Chinese. They just don't have the, end, the bottomless pit of money uh, that comes from the Chinese state banks. The NOCs from oil exporting countries are often very happy to work with Chinese, uh, as I say, for their skills, technology, for their money, and for the opportunity to, to integrate into the Chinese market. What does it mean for regional security in the Gulf and Southeast Asia? It means that China's interest in these regions are, is just getting bigger and bigger. So you want to talk about Southeast Asia, you want to talk about the Middle East, you cannot leave the Chinese out of these conversations. 
relations with states in Africa, former Soviet Union, Latin America, I mean, diplomacy, resource investment, other economic activities basically mean that wherever you go in the world, China is there. Uh, and the oil industry and the minerals industry and other resources are probably there in a big way. So that's the end of that story. I'm happy to take questions on that or on the unspoken story of China and climate change and internal energy governance. Thank you very much.